Okay, we're going to be starting uh, reproduction today. So let's take a look. And when we talk about pregnancy, it's always best, as we know, to plan for a pregnancy rather than having to react to a pregnancy. And the reason why we want to talk about the planning of a pregnancy is more in alignment with, I wouldn't get up one day and try and run a marathon, right? I'm just not engineered for it. I haven't trained for it. I'm not prepared for it. Nutritionally, mentally, there's just so many components and my body is not optimized to handle that. And we want to make sure for the well-being of mom and the well-being of the developing baby that the environment is completely optimized for a healthy development of a baby. So that if a mother is smoking, that gives her the ability to quit smoking. And if there's alcohol consumption, to eliminate drinking to start consuming a nutrient-dense diet, to start utilizing a prenatal multivitamin and multimineral supplement, exercising, checking for any sexually transmitted diseases, uh, checking prescription and non-prescription drugs, looking at all of the uh, drug-induced nutrient depletions that are associated, especially looking at um, folate, making sure that folate levels are not depleted in mom and that mom is taking the appropriate form um, 5 methyl tetrahydrofolate um, and not folic acid if there are any type of SNPs, any singular uh, nuclear polymorphisms especially in MTHFR the methylene tetrahydrofolate reductase uh, issue. We want to make sure that folate is properly metabolized and can work in harmony with B6 and B12. Okay, so you may want to kind of research the methylation pathway and look at the very, very close intimate connection between B6, B9, and B12. Otherwise, homocysteine levels rise blood vessel integrity is, is harmed, neurotransmitter function is compromised, uh, issues like neural tube defects and um, hair lip um, or um, depression and migraines and spinal tube issues and meningomyeloceles and um, the list goes on and on. Infertility within itself, these are all um, possibilities of MTHFR issues, whether it's the C6770 or A1298C. Um, okay, what else? Let's see, reduction of stress, avoid toxic foods and pesticides and herbicides, and of course, uh, chiropractic care for optimal pelvic alignment. Remember, there is a baby that needs to properly move in that pelvic brim and of course the appropriate nerve supply to that developing baby is key all right let's take a look at the male reproductive organs and then there'll be a few videos that i show and then we'll look at the female and a few videos i may be skipping through uh, some of the slides, if I feel the videos have done a good enough job, especially with um, oogenesis and spermatogenesis. So let's take a look at some of the primary uh, organs on the male side. So we have the scrotum, which houses the testes. And you'll notice that the scrotum here is housing the testes outside of the body. Why? Because it's about three degrees cooler there, which seems to be the optimal temperature for sperm production. And then we have this structure here called the epididymis. And then we have the vas deferens or the ductus deferens right here. So in the testes, we have uh, sperm 
that are produced there and then in the epididymis sperm get to mature there and then sperm are stored in the vas deferens. What other structures uh, do we have here that are important? We have the prepus, which is the foreskin. Very important to notice that in anatomy and physiology, you'll see that the prepus is always present. This is the way males come into the world. And whether it be for religious reasons or some cultural reasons, the prepus uh, can be removed. And that's a circumcision. Um, this is up for debate. Uh, there is not significant um, supporting evidence that it decreases STDs and it's healthier for males to be circumcised. Um, in fact, there is a growing movement for uh, the foreskin to be left. It's been um, a movement in Europe for quite some time, and now it's moving back to the United States where the incidence of circumcision is certainly less and less. Um, let's see what else we have here. Um, then there's the glands, the glands penis. And then we have the corpora cavernosum, which is here. And then the corpus spongiosum. We're going to be taking a closer look at those structures. They're involved with uh, a large part of being the erectile tissue of the penis. Then we have some glands. We have Cowper's gland, which is also referred to as the bulbo urethral gland. And we have the prostate gland. And we have the seminal vesicle. So these are all supporting um, semen production and creating a particular environment within the uh, urethra for sperm uh, to live. We also have the ejaculatory duct right here. And then we have the urethra. When it's going through the prostate, it's called a prostatic urethra. And when it's going through the spongy cavernosum and corpus spongiosum, uh, it's called a spongy urethra. Okay, so those are some primary organs. Then here's the urinary bladder. And you'll notice that the urethra, the urethra um, is a, uh, a one duct system for both urinary and for both reproductive function. Okay, you can see that very clearly here. It's the same duct that urine comes through as well as uh, sperm. Okay, let's move on. Same structures. This is just now in a, in a cadaver. So if you want to pause it and go back and forth, you'd be able to uh, compare. Here is the prostate. Corpus cavernosum and the spongiosum. Here's the testes, the glands. Here's the ejaculatory duct, prostatic urethra, seminal vesicle, vas deferens. Okay, so the scrotum is a sac, uh, a sac of loose skin and Underlying the subcutaneous tissue that houses the testes. It's three degrees cooler outside of the body. If it's um, too cold, then there are uh, muscles that can contract to pull the testes closer uh, to the closer to the core. And we can see here the cremasteric or cremaster muscle is one of those very important muscles that's responsible for that. Um, internally, the, it is separated into two compartments uh, by the dartos muscle and the subcutaneous layer. So we can see the dartos muscle right here, this layer. 
could see it there. We could see the scrotum. And we can see the testes here. So the testes are paired uh, oval glands in the scrotum and they're partially covered by the tunica vaginalis. Don't be confused by vaginalis thinking it's female, but if we go back, you can see these two tunica layers. Let me change this to blue. And we can see the tunica vaginalis here and the tunica albuginea here. Right, the tunica we've heard of before, right? Just like with blood vessels, tunica interna, tunica media, tunica adventitia. So the internal to the tunica vaginalis is a connective tissue capsule. And the tunica albuginea uh, that extends inward to form the septa that creates these different compartments. The seminiferous tubules carry sperm produced within them. That's called spermatogenesis out of the testes. So the seminiferous tubules, that's where um, the sperm are actually produced inside the testes. We'll show you where that is. So here, I'm going to circle it. Here's the seminiferous tubules. That's a pretty important layer. That's where the sperm are produced inside. And of course, there are some cells in there that are responsible for doing that. But there's a lot of moving parts in here. But if you know uh, seminiferous tubules, that's great. And you can see these are called septum. Septum like nasal septum. It's just a divider. We can see one here. We can see one here. And when we take one of these sections, this is now considered a lobule. And then here is the epididymis. You can see there's the body of the epididymis. There's the head of the epididymis. So the epididymis is going to be kind of like this entire section up in here. That would be the epididymis, right? And then here's the testes. There's the testes, this circle. Epididymis is above that. And then you're going to have the vas deferens or the ductus deferens that moves up in this direction. Okay. Here's the spermatocord. It's a combination of a lot of different vessels and nerve plexuses that travel through and up. Same structures, just in a cadaver. You can see on the right-hand side there the seminiferous tubules again. The testes are cut in half, so we're looking at it from the, the inside view there. And then again on the left-hand side, you can see here's the testes. And that's the cross section of it. That's why you can see the seven or first tubules there. Then you have the epididymis, which is here. And then that would be up in this direction. Okay, spermatogenesis begins with spermatogonia, uh, diploid stem cells that differentiate into diploid primary spermatocytes. So we're going to go through a video in just a, a little bit that kind of shows the the entire process but we can kind of see it in the middle here spermatogenic cells right in here so you have that spermatogonium which is the stem cell then it goes to a primary spermatocyte secondary spermatocyte spermatid and then you have your sperm cell okay you're going to hear these cells here, interstitial cells or Leydig cells. You're going to hear this term, Leydig, in a little bit. And then the blood testy barrier, tight junctions. You remember that. Tight junctions, which are a bunch of epithelial cells that come together. Otherwise, these become leaky, like a leaky gut or a leaky brain or leaky blood vessels. So these create a lot of um, uh, pathologies. A lot of dysfunction. All right, let's take a look at one of these videos here.
Let's make this a little larger for you. Spermatogenesis is the production of male gametes, or sperm cells. The two testes are the sites of spermatogenesis, or sperm production. Within the testes, the specific sites of spermatogenesis are the walls of the seminiferous tubules. Spermatogenesis begins with the spermatogonia cells at the onset of puberty. Following DNA replication during interphase, spermatogonia are diploid stem cells having 46 sister chromatids, or 92 DNA molecules. Stem cells are less differentiated cells that can undergo mitotic cell division, thus producing cells that undergo further differentiation. One daughter cell stays near the basement membrane and remains a stem cell. The other daughter cell loses contact with the basement membrane. Upon losing contact with the basement membrane, the second daughter cell is squeezed through the tight junctions formed by the Sertoli cells. Tight junctions. This daughter cell undergoes biochemical changes and differentiates into a primary spermatocyte. Each primary spermatocyte has the same number of chromosomes as a spermatogonia cell. Each primary spermatocyte enlarges, and the first meiotic cell division begins. As a result of the first meiotic division, two haploid secondary spermatocytes are formed. Each secondary spermatocyte has 23 chromosomes. Since each chromosome has two sister chromatids, each cell contains 46 DNA molecules. All of the secondary spermatocytes undergo the second meiotic division. As a result of the second meiotic division, four haploid spermatids are formed. Each haploid spermatid has 23 chromosomes. However, since each chromosome consists of only one chromatid, one copy of DNA, then each spermatid contains 23 DNA molecules. The final stage of spermatogenesis is spermiogenesis. Spermiogenesis is the maturation of haploid spermatids into sperm, also termed spermatozoa. There are a number of changes that happen to spermatids during spermiogenesis. The spherical spermatids turn into longer, slender sperm. An acrosome develops on the side of the nucleus, which condenses and elongates. A flagellum also develops, and mitochondria multiply. Mitochondria. Finally, the sperm cells are released from their connections to Sertoli cells and enter the lumen of the seminiferous tubule. Sertoli cells secrete fluids that nutritionally support sperm, as well as drive them along the seminiferous tubule toward the epididymis. Great, that was a very good review. Let's go back to our PowerPoint. So the primary spermatocyte undergoes meiosis one to become the two secondary spermatocytes and mitosis two takes place and the secondary spermatocytes become four spermatids. Okay, you could see that down here you can see the spermatids, right? You can see the primary spermatocyte. You can see meiosis phase one, meiosis phase two, right? You can see meiosis over here. You can see meiosis here, and then spermiogenesis 
here. Okay. Uh, sperm is designed to reach and penetrate the secondary oocyte in order to achieve fertilization and create a zygote. And we'll go over the female reproductive tract shortly. Uh, fertilization is supposed to take place uh, in the fallopian tubes, and then the implantation should take place uh, inside the uterus. Um, the head contains a nucleus with 23 chromosomes, and the acrosome covers the head and contains enzymes to help with the penetration. Penetration of what? The egg, right? So the acrosome is that head of the sperm and it's going to release these very strong hydrolytic uh, digestive enzymes to break through the proteins of the shell of the egg to penetrate it. Uh, the neck contains centrioles that form the microtubules that make up the rest of the tail. And remember microtubules uh, from the very beginning when you look at the cell and the organelle, they make up the cytoskeleton. There are microtubules, um, there are microfilaments, so uh, the microtubules help to make up the, the tail. And the middle portion uh, of the sperm have the mitochondria. And mitochondria is responsible for making ATP, which is going to provide energy for the locomotion of the sperm to help mobilize the flagella and whip it around. Okay, so um, a lot of the times if we're looking at um, infertility issues, sometimes it's a matter of, well, can we consider it to be a male issue in terms of a mitochondrial dysfunction? Can we properly fuel the sperm with the proper nutrition that they need so that they have the energy um, to, to move around? Uh, and the principal piece and the end piece make up the tail that's used for movement. So if we look at their basic anatomy again, so here's the acrosome, that's really important. We look at the body of it, we can see the mitochondria, highly concentrated in the middle piece. And then here's the principal piece, and then the end piece. Those are all part of the tail, right? So sperm really just have the head, and then they have the tail. And the mitochondria looks like the body of it, and the principal piece and the end piece are all parts of the tail. Uh, hormones that control testicular function at puberty, gonadotropin releasing hormone stimulates cells in the anterior pituitary, remember the adenohypothesis. Uh, that's where you have about seven different hormones that are produced. Um, so you're going to have the gonadotropin releasing hormone that stimulates the anterior pituitary to produce LH and FSH. LH is luteinizing hormone. FSH is follicle stimulating hormone. FSH is going to be involved with spermatogenesis and LH is going to stimulate the cells of the testes to produce testosterone. Okay, those are the uh, interstitial cells of Leydig, the interstitial cells of Leydig. All right, if we look here, uh, you know what, I'm going to probably skip through this because there's going to be a video coming up that's going to walk through the process. Um, so just keep in mind, you may just want to like put a star next to this um, or, you know, we'll just come back to this one in a bit knowing that there's going to be a brief little video that kind of walks through the, the feedback system here. But in a quick nutshell, I just want to show you that we're talking about here is the hypothalamus on top. You can see gonadotropin releasing hormone. Here is the anterior portion of the pituitary adenohypothesis. And you can see follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone that are both released. You can see that the luteinizing hormone is going to stimulate the testosterone secretion. And we're going to see here FSH together with testosterone. Uh, FSH is going to stimulate the spermatogenesis, and that's what we're seeing here. Um, we could see that testosterone, dihydrotestosterone, it's involved with male pattern 
uh, development, so like your secondary sex characteristics, um, enlargement of the male sex organs, expression of male secondary sex characteristics, and anabolism, which is going to be building up the body or uh, protein synthesis. Testosterone and dihydrotestosterone uh, produce several different effects. Prenatal development, secondary sexual characteristics, development of sexual function, and anabolism. And there's a negative feedback system that's going to control the blood level of testosterone. Let's just take a look, and I'm sure this may come up as a discussion. So it all starts with cholesterol up on the top left there, right? Well, cholesterol is bad for you. Try and eliminate it from your diet. And if it gets too high, well, let's put someone on a, you know, a statin drug that's going to block the HMG CoA reductase uh, to kind of limit cholesterol production. But you can see how very, very important it's a primary ingredient. Uh, something else that you may hear of, uh, something called a pregnenolone steel, which is the preferred pathway when there's stress involved. We have this pregnenolone pathway that will push in this green region here, which is towards cortisol production. Okay, And that's why when you're under stress, sometimes it's difficult uh, for couples to get pregnant due to the decrease and everything that's happening over here, right? We're going to have decreased testosterone, decreased estradiol, decreased estrone, right? You decrease in sex hormones because you're primarily pushing through a stress reaction. They call that the pregnenolone steel. Okay, let's take a look at uh, a video that should be coming up that's going to go over this, but you're going to see that there's some stimulus that can disrupt the homeostasis, um, the controlled condition here, blood level of testosterone. There are receptors in the hypothalamus that will then secrete gonadotropin releasing hormone, and um, that input is going to go to the anterior pituitary. And the output is going to go to the effector, which is the Leydig cells or the interstitial cells of Leydig. And the response is going to involve this feedback loop of either increasing or decreasing testosterone production. So there is a system of ducts in the male, in the male reproductive system. Uh, sperm and fluid are going to travel from the seminiferous tubules to the straight tubules and then to a network of ducts. Uh, efferent ducts carry the sperm to the epididymis. Sperm are going to mature in the epididymis and degenerated sperm are then reabsorbed. Uh, the epididymis propels sperm into the vas deferens or ductus deferens. So here, let's walk you through some of the anatomy here. So again, you can see the testes right here. Testes are going to uh, produce sperm and they are going to mature in the epididymis and they're going to be stored here in the ductus deferens. And then during ejaculation, you're going to see so sperm is moving up in this direction here. And then we have the seminal vesicle that's going to produce quite a bit of semen and it's going to push and ejaculate that into the ejaculatory duct and it's going to come right through here in this direction this is the prostate gland so the urethra going through it is the prostatic urethra it's going to come through in this direction and we can't forget the cowper's gland or the bulbo urethral gland that's going to secrete a different type of solution we'll talk about that going through the urethra spongy urethra now let me change the color of the pen for a second let's make it red so here you're going to have the spongy urethra so we have the corpus cavernosum and we're going to have the corpus spongiosum on a cross section right if we were to cut it through this way, 
probably not the best terminology to use talking about reproductive tract. But anyway, if you put a slice through this way, now we're looking at the bottom image. So let's say, let's call this number one, and then this number two, and then right here in the center, we'll call that number three. So this is number one on the bottom. This is number two. And then on the bottom here is number three. Okay, that kind of puts things in perspective. So um, there are blood vessels, you can see deep arteries going through here. As a result of nitric oxide, you're gonna get this vasodilation that takes place. And this corpus cavernosum is going to engorge with blood and the um, drainage veins become blocked. So there's incoming blood, but not exiting blood. So it creates the erection. And then the urethra here is kept open for ejaculate, right? For the ejaculation. Uh, what else do we have? Here's the glans penis, the prepis or the foreskin, and the external urethral orifice. Same structures here. We have the seminal vesicle. Well, let me go back here. Let's look at some of the glands. Uh, here's the prostate gland. That's pretty straightforward. Think of the prostate gland. It's like, it's like a donut, right? The hole in the middle, that's for the prostatic urethra to go through. Then we have the seminal vesicle. And you could see a little bit of the corpus spongiosum here and the corpus cavernosum, the erectile tissue. Let's not forget about that third gland the Cowper's gland or bulbourethral gland. So let's call prostate one, the seminal vesicle two, and bulbourethral as, as the third, all right? Uh, spermatocord ascends out of the scrotum and contains the ductus deferens, testicular artery, uh, veins draining the testes, autonomic nerves, uh, lymphatic vessels, and the cremaster muscle. Spermatic cord and the ilioinguinal nerve pass through the inguinal canal, which originates in the deep inguinal ring and ends at the superficial inguinal ring. So here, let's see if I could bring the, let's use, let's look at the color here. Uh, let's see how, how magenta looks. That's pretty good. Um, so you can see, again, the scrotum down here at the bottom, and then the dartos muscle. Here is the corpus cavernosum and the corpus spongiosum, right? So here's the cross-section of the shaft of the penis. Here's the spermatic cord. Here's the superficial or the cutaneous ring. Here's the cremaster muscle. You can see we have the autonomic nerve, testicular artery, lymphatic vessel, testicular veins, all traveling through there, okay? Here's the cremasteric muscle on the right-hand side, and you can also see it on the left-hand side. It's just a little bit more uh, superficial. Let's look at it here. Here's the cremasteric muscle here. Again, why not? Repetition, repetition, repetition. There's the corpus cavernosum and the corpus spongiosum, right? The spongiosum is the one that's closest to the urethra, the spongy urethra. Then we have the prostate gland and then we have the bulbourethral gland. We'll talk about um, what they secrete in just a minute. So the seminal vesicle, they secrete an alkaline viscous fluid that contains fructose, sugar, right? The reason why it's alkaline, the reason why it's alkaline is because the majority of urine tends to be acidic, 
right? pH somewhere around 5.5, somewhere around there. Um, fructose, because remember the mitochondria, energy production. Uh, prostaglandins, um, it's interesting, the prostaglandins that are produced by the male, it's actually going to have some effect on the female reproductive tract, creating contractions on the female end. And then there's also clotting proteins that are needed. Um, the prostate, that is um, a single gland, it's donut shaped. It secretes a milky, slightly acidic fluid that contains citric acid, uh, proteolytic enzymes, acid phosphatase, and seminoplasmin. And acid phosphatase is gonna be important. Um, there's uh, testing for that as well proteolytic enzymes, proteolytic, these are enzymes that may be of importance for the sperm to break through the egg. And the bulbourethral gland, much like the seminal vesicle, is going to secrete an alkaline fluid during sexual arousal to try and neutralize some of the acidic um, or acidity from the urine. Okay, and there's also mucus for lubrication as well. I just wanted to show you uh, BPH, a condition that's somewhat common in older uh, men, typically seen with lower back pain, um, the urgency to have to go urinate and pee, but very little flow. Um, you can see on the left-hand side is the urinary bladder. You can see the urethra that's open. You can see the prostate gland. You can see the seminal vesicle as well right here. Here's the seminal vesicle. Right here is the ejaculatory duct. This is the prostatic urethra. And here on this side, we can see that there's BPH, benign prosthetic hypertrophy. When the prostate gland enlarges, it just doesn't grow outward and become bigger. It grows inward and compresses the prostatic urethra. So it gives the urgency that the gentleman has to urinate but the flow is very, very weak coming through there. Again, you can see the benign prostatic um, hypertrophy and it's compressing, actually compressing the um, prostatic urethra on the right-hand side. Um, again, so the testes are paired organs. Uh, they represent the male gonads. They're housed in the scrotum. It's three degrees cooler there. Um, if it's too cool, then the cremasteric muscle contracts, pulling the testes up towards core temperature. The seminiferous tubules, these are tubules that are located in the testes where the sperm are produced. The epididymis is just above that, and that's where the sperm mature. And then the vas deferens or ductus deferens um, is the area that's going to store the sperm. You've heard of the vas deferens, and here's a vasectomy. So we can see that when there is a vasectomy, we can see the cut. We can see the vas deferens is cut right here. Okay, so the sperm and the hormones are still produced, but you don't have sperm that's connecting in this way that's going to come through the ejaculate. Fluids can still be secreted from here. Semen could be secreted, but no sperm, okay? So the erection and ejaculation continues as before, but the semen is going to contain no sperm. Uh, semen is a mixture of sperm and seminal fluid. The volume of the average ejaculate is 2.5 to 5 milliliters with about 50 to 150 million sperm per milliliter. The pH is about 7.2 to 7.7, right? So we're talking about slightly alkalinic. Uh, the penis contains the urethra, and it's the passage for semen and urine. It's composed of those three cylindrical masses that we showed you before, two of the corpora cavernosa and one corpora spongiosum. And then there's the glans penis, which is the head of the penis that's covered by the foreskin or the prepus. And again, just another cross-section showing that same anatomy. So here is the corpus cavernosa. And you can see that there are some deep arteries. And then we have some superficial ones. You can see here, superficial or subcutaneous dorsal vein. 
you can see that there's a dorsal artery. There's a deep dorsal vein here. And you can see here's the deep artery of the penis. And then you have the corpus spongiosum here. And then here's the spongy urethra. On a cadaver, it's going to look like here. So here's one. Let's change the color here. Here's one, two, and then there's the third with the spongy urethra right here. All right, let's talk about the um, the erection here a little bit and the role that the ANS or autonomic nervous system has in uh, sexual arousal and reproduction. So an erection is brought out by the parasympathetic. Remember, parasympathetic is called and referred to as the, let me go back here, it's called the craniosacral outflow. And the cranial nerves were cranial nerve uh, 3, 7, 9, and 10. And of course, you would have to know those by Roman numeral, not by these numbers, but you would have to know that 3 is like this, and then 7 is like that, and then 9 is the X with the 1 before it, and then 10 is like this three seven nine and ten and then you have s2 s3 and s4 so craniosacral alpha that's parasympathetic feed or breed right feed and breed rest and digest that's all parasympathetic um, so the parasympathetic innervation leads to the vasodilation of the arterioles in erectile tissue Large amounts of blood enters the tissue of the dilated uh, sinuses. The ejaculation, on the other hand, um, that's the powerful release of semen, and that is going to be due to sympathetic stimulation. Okay, so the erection is more parasympathetic, but then the ejaculation is sympathetic. Um, enlargement and stiffening of the penis from engorgement of the erectile tissue with the blood, again, parasympathetic. Uh, during the sexual arousal, a peripheral neural system reflex promotes the release of nitric oxide. Nitric oxide, NO, is a powerful neurotransmitter, and it comes from arginine, and it vasodilates. So the nitric oxide causes the erectile tissue to fill with blood. You're going to get the expansion of the corpora cavernosa. And when that happens, it's going to compress the drainage veins. When you compress the drainage veins, blood vessels come in from the artery, but it's going to slow down and retard the blood outflow. And that way it maintains the engorgement. Okay. The corpus spongiosum functions in keeping the urethra open during the ejaculation. So some of the, if you look at the neural circuits here, if we look at the neural circuits, there are many things that are involved in arousal. So there are erotic sights, there are smells involved, there are thoughts involved, even sounds, and all of that input has a major effect on so does mechanoreceptors from stimulation here is going to create the erectile tissue to the penis. You can see the arterioles are dilated here, whereas the veins are compressed right over there. You can see that here. Okay. Let's look at hormonal control. Hormonal mechanisms that influence male reproductive function involve endocrine tissues contained in the hypothalamus of the brain, the anterior pituitary, and the testes. In the hypothalamus, 
Certain neurosecretory cells secrete gonadotropin-releasing hormone. Gonadotropin-releasing hormone is carried by the blood to the anterior pituitary, where it binds to receptors on gonadotrophs and stimulates the cells to increase secretion of two gonadotropic hormones, luteinizing hormone, or LH, and follicle-stimulating hormone, or FSH. LH and FSH are transported in the blood to the testes. LH and FSH both indirectly affect spermatogenesis. LH binds to receptors on Leydig cells between seminiferous tubules and stimulates the secretion of testosterone. Under the influence of FSH and testosterone, Sertoli cells produce androgen binding protein. ABP binds to testosterone and maintains high levels of the hormone near the spermatogenic cells. Under the influence of testosterone, Sertoli cells nurture the stem cells and the developing sperm cells. Testosterone stimulates the final stages of spermatogenesis. In addition, testosterone is converted into dihydrotestosterone, another hormone that may promote sperm cell formation. Testosterone and dihydrotestosterone both bind to the same intranuclear receptors. Together, the androgens regulate male prenatal development and the development of male sexual characteristics. Sertoli cells release the protein hormone inhibin when the level of spermatogenesis required for male reproductive functions has been attained. Inhibin is delivered by the blood to the gonadotrophic cells within the anterior pituitary. Inhibin acts on the gonadotrophs to reduce FSH secretion and thereby decreases the rate of spermatogenesis. Similarly, testosterone acts in a negative feedback manner on anterior pituitary gonadotrophs to suppress the secretion of LH. The negative feedback effect of testosterone also involves its effect on the hypothalamus, the result of which is decreased secretion of gonadotropin-releasing hormone. Decreased secretion of gonadotropin-releasing hormone causes a corresponding decrease in the secretion of both LH and FSH. The decrease in LH causes a decrease in the secretion of testosterone by the Leydig cells in the testes. Low levels of testosterone reduce spermatogenesis. Conversely, an excessive decrease in testosterone allows the hypothalamus to increase its secretion of gonadotropin-releasing hormone. This secretion causes an increase in anterior pituitary secretion of LH and FSH and an increase in secretion of testosterone by the testes. Sertoli cells release the protein hormone inhibin when the level of spermatogenesis required for male reproductive functions has been attained. Inhibin is delivered by the blood to the gonadotrophic cells within the anterior pituitary. Inhibin acts on the gonadotrophs to reduce FSH secretion and thereby decreases the rate of spermatogenesis. Similarly, Testosterone acts in a negative feedback manner on anterior pituitary gonadotrophs to suppress the secretion of LH. The negative feedback effect of testosterone also involves its effect on the hypothalamus, the result of which is decreased secretion of gonadotropin-releasing hormone. Decreased secretion of gonadotropin-releasing hormone causes a corresponding decrease in the secretion of both LH and FSH. The decrease in LH causes a decrease in the secretion of testosterone by the Leydig cells in the testes. Low levels of testosterone reduce spermatogenesis. Conversely, 
an excessive decrease in testosterone allows the hypothalamus to increase its secretion of gonadotropin-releasing hormone. This secretion causes an increase in anterior pituitary secretion of LH and FSH and an increase in secretion of testosterone by the testes. Excellent. Just thought you needed to hear that a second time. Okay, so let's look at the female reproductive system. Uh, we'll highlight a few of the important anatomical structures and functions, and then we'll show again probably one or two short video clips on it. Um, so when we talk about the female reproductive, there are there's a little bit more detail involved uh, because we have to talk about the hormones and the different phases that are involved in menstruation and building up the um, endometrial lining uh, of the uterus and um, fertilization and implantation and the hormonal effects on what happens inside the ovary to produce uh, a mature egg, okay? Okay, so let's highlight a few areas here. This is a cross section of the female reproductive tract and orienting yourself. So we're looking at it from this view, right? So this is anterior and this side here is posterior. We know that because you can see the sacrum back here. And then in the front, we could see the pubic symphysis, okay? So let's start from the bottom. We have lips, right? The two lips. Uh, there's the labia majora, and the labia minor. These are the protective coverings. There is the clitoris here, and then we have the urethra. We can have the urethra here, and here is the urinary bladder. Okay, now notice that the urethra here in the female, but and then in the female, there's the vaginal canal. And here is the uterus. And then there is the anus back here. So there's three routes of entrance and exiting going on here, right? So in the male, it's just, you know, anus and urethra. The re urethra in the male is for both uh, reproductive and urinary. In the female, it's separate. So the urethra is purely for urine, and then posterior to it is the vagina with the rugae of the vagina, the vaginal canal leading up into the uterus and all its moving parts as well. Okay, the you can see here is the uterus. There are some ligaments like the round ligament of the uterus. We can see here. And I'll show you the different parts of the uterus in a different cross section. This one's not the best. Um, the ovaries are pair, paired glands, and that would be homologous to the testes. The ovaries are producing gametes, which mature into an ova. And the hormones involved are progesterone, estrogen, inhibin, and relaxin. Uh, they are supported by the broad ligament, ovarian ligament, and suspensory ligament. The uterus is a large mass of smooth muscle in the woman's body. It's a hollow muscular organ, and it's the site of menstruation. It's the site of implantation. It's the site of development of the human embryo or fetus. And um, it is a sac-like structure. It's located between the urinary bladder and the rectum. And it's going to resemble an inverted pear in both its size and its shape. And there are three different layers. The outermost is the perimetrium. And the smooth muscle layer is the myometrium. And then the innermost layer is the endometrium. So this is a really nice picture that shows the different layers 
Here is the uterine cavity. And then we have one, two, three layers right here. So there's the endometrium, which is the innermost lining, which would be here. Then there's the myometrium. That is the uh, thickest layer. That's going to be here. And then we have the outermost layer, the perimetrium. The top part here is the fundus. And then we have some other structures. Uh, this is the fallopian tube, also known as the uterine tube, and it has a few different parts to it. This is the ampulla of the uterine tube. This is the isthmus of the uterine tube. For our purposes, I'm happy if you just know that this entire structure right here is the uterine tube or fallopian tube. Okay. Another very important structure is these little finger-like extensions right here. It's not labeled, but it would be called the uh, fimbriae. Uh, let's see if we can spell it here. F I M B R A fimbriae. The little fingers. And you'll notice that they're not really in contact with the ovary that's right here. But at ovulation, when Let's change this to black. When an egg is pushed out here, it's ovulated as a result of what we call the LH spike or LH surge, which stands for luteinizing hormone. And this egg, this mature egg is now pushed out. The fingers, the fimbriae, are going to scoop that up and move it in this direction. And all along here, there's going to be these little villi, these little hairs all along here. And it's going to be on both sides, right? We're going to have these small little villi, these hair-like structures. And they're beating in this direction. They're beating rhythmically along this path. Okay. And remember, there's sperm coming in this way. Sperm are moving this way. Sperm are moving this way. Okay, and what is going to happen is when that sperm and that egg meet, when you have this, and this, and this enters, and we'll go through that as well, that's called fertilization. That should happen somewhere here in the fallopian tube. Implantation, I'll put an I here, implantation should take place there. Should never happen in the fallopian tubes. Okay, that's called an ectopic pregnancy, right? Okay, what else do we have? Then there's the fornix. The fornix is this invagination that takes place here and here. And then you have the cervix, which is this part here. This is the cervix. Okay, the fornix is here. And the rugae is the roughened portion here inside the vaginal canal. Um, Going back here for a second, you've heard of a pap smear named after George Papanakulau. A pap smear is really when they slough some cells off of this region here, of the cervix. And they're looking for any abnormal cells where if they start seeing where you have on the left-hand side, you know, these large irregular looking ones, that's a problem, okay? Usually they call that dysplasia, cervical dysplasia. Um, from a nutritional perspective, there are many studies out there that show that when B9 is depleted, which happens as a drug-induced nutrient depletion from the oral contraceptive, 
this is a possibility, uh, which is why women should not try and conceive first month after coming off the pill when they're trying to plan a pregnancy, but wait until the folate levels start to get up there. Because if you um, fertilize an egg and have implantation before folate levels are increased, uh, I think the potential for problems certainly increase. Okay, so the myometrium is the middle layer of the uterus. It's composed of smooth muscle. It's involuntary. And we know that it is a muscle that responds very well to oxytocin that is secreted, produced by the hypothalamus, but it is released by the posterior pituitary or the neurohypophysis, and it's going to maintain uterine contractions during labor. Um, the synthetic form of it is called ptosin. Um, I think the spelling there may be wrong. I think it's P-T instead of P-I-T, but it's called ptosin. And uh, it's synthetic and it's designed to bring on uterine contractions to induce uh, labor. Okay, estrogen and progesterone are two other hormones that can affect uterine contractions and even cause menstrual cramping. The endometrium, which is the innermost layer, um, it's epithelial cells. Remember cells that uh, come close together, very little extracellular substance, but lots of cells. And um, they are, the epithelium is referred to as endometrial cells and they respond to hormones. On average, a menses cycle could be somewhere between 28 days and 34 to 36 days. Uh, the first day of menstrual cycle, day one, is the first day of bleeding. And the bleeding results from sloughing off of the shedding of the old endometrial layer in order to prepare for the formation of a new endometrial layer. And it's based on the constriction of the blood vessels that permeate into the endometrium. If it's not getting the blood supply, those cells die and they slough off and shed. Okay, when there's dilation of blood vessels there, it's going to re-nourish them. So the process takes about three to five days in most females. Uh, when the old endometrial layer is removed, the remaining endometrial cells must increase in size and in number, hyperplasia and hypertrophy. Hyperplasia is the increase in number and hypertrophy is the increase in size. In order to produce the new endometrial lying and prepare the uterus for uh, implantation of the fertilized egg, the endometrial cells are going to increase in size by storing carbohydrates and lipids and proteins, vitamins, minerals, and water. And the nutrients will be used by the developing embryo to nourish itself while it forms the placenta. So nutrition is extremely, extremely important here. This just shows the endometrial layer up on top, uh, how it sloughed after menstruation. This one here is now proliferation and hypertrophy of the endometrial cells. You can see it's very thick on top, that top layer. And here it's ready for uh, implantation that tube up on top that hollowed out section let's see if i can highlight it here right in here this is all of this in here this cavity this entire space that's all the uterine tube okay and this is all endometrium all of this are just vacuoles that contain nutrients here this layer is all smooth muscle that's all smooth muscle. Endometriosis, that's a condition that's characterized by the growth of endometrial tissue outside of the uterus. Uh, the symptoms of, endometri of endometriosis include cramping, abdominal cramps, and difficulty conceiving, an irregular pattern of menses. Um, it's typically caused by a retrograde of menstrual flow and reduced uh, T lymphocyte activity. Ectopic pregnancy is any pregnancy that occurs outside of the uterus. Anywhere but implanting the fertilized egg in the uterus is an ectopic pregnancy. Um, the ectopic pregnancy can rupture. You can have internal bleeding. Um, usually a uh, history of uh, pelvic inflammatory disease, PID, pelvic inflammatory disease, is associated uh, with that. Placenta. When the fertilized egg or the embryo implants upon the endometrium of the uterus, it will begin to digest the endometrial cells and metabolize the nutrients contained within them to form the placenta. So the placenta is a complex of 
um, a network of blood vessels that's developed uh, by the baby, and it's used to facilitate the exchange of substances, not blood. There's no exchange of blood there between the baby and the mother. And the baby will generally implant on the upper posterior portion of the placenta, or the upper posterior portion of the uterus. That's what a placenta looks like. You can see the umbilical cord. And again, here are some other structures that you can see. You can see the baby, you can see the umbilical cord right here. You can see the yolk sac. You can see the amniotic fluid. When you hear of um, amniocentesis, they actually are injecting a needle and extracting here fluid for DNA analysis. It certainly has its risks. This is just showing you what a six week old baby looks like. You can see a lot of the structures here are forming. You can see the hands, you can see the little feet. You can even see here, this is the umbilical cord. And right there, that's a boy, okay? Um, mucus plugs, uh, oftentimes when a baby comes out, you'll see that they take the suction, they put it inside the baby's nose, they release to pull out the mucus plugs. Typically in most babies, once they start crying, those plugs are pushed out, you know, just by innate. Um, and the, the plugs are there to prevent any type of aspiration of fluid into the baby's lungs. Stages of birth. What I'm showing you here, the reason why I have this picture, is just to show you um, what happens when a woman is lying supine. You can see here is the spine, right? You can see the lumbar spine. You can see the sacrum here. And there's a lot of nerve endings that go to the smooth muscle that help to push the baby out. But you have anywhere from seven to 10 pounds, seven to 10 pounds of baby of pressure on the spine. And that can compress the nerve endings, which makes, um, birthing and labor very challenging for a woman. Now, if the woman was upright and you're using this force of gravity that works in this position, right? Now you have a woman lying down. She's recumbent over here in all of these pictures, right? This is lying down. Gravity has a very difficult time working here. If the woman sits up or squatting or standing and squatting, now what ends up happening is the baby actually spins. There's this spinning that takes place and the baby spins out of the birth canal. There's no spinning that typically takes place in supine delivery because of that gravitational pull and the innate intelligence, they don't connect very well. So this is where when the baby crowns, doctors pull. They have to pull on the neck and then turn. But I've actually seen several deliveries in birthing tubs where the baby just spins automatically. In a squatting position, in birthing chairs, I see the baby spin. No external force is needed. Pretty smooth transition. The baby spins. But if the baby doesn't spin and the doctor has to traction the neck out and rotate, it can oftentimes create subluxation of C1 and C2, the atlantoaxial articulation which becomes a major issue because C1 and C2 houses the medulla oblongata. And there are some really important cranial nerves there, especially cranial nerve 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12. And the biggie is cranial nerve 10, the vagus nerve. That controls like 80% of autonomic function, maybe even 90% of autonomic function goes to the stomach, it goes to the liver, it goes to the heart, it goes to the intestines and to the stomach and the heart. And now you have these autonomic imbalances. And this is why the doctors and nurses look at the APGAR scoring. They look at the breathing rate. They look at the color of the baby, look at blood supply. They look at all of these things, autonom, how many, you know, respirations per minute. And if that vagal nerve is disturbed, you're going to get autonomic dysfunction. 
This is oftentimes when you hear of babies that have projectile vomiting shortly after birth. They can't hold down breast milk or they can't hold down formula. It's from subluxation, typically at C1 and C2, distorting the impulses to the digestive tract and those valves between the esophagus and the stomach, they don't open and close properly. That lower esophageal uh, sphincter or the cardiac sphincter, which is between the esophagus and the stomach. And that's when they put these babies on these uh, antacids. It's probably the number one prescribed medication for infants. Um, already starting to affect the pH of the stomach, which affects the bacterial overgrowth, and it becomes a real, real mess. Also, when there's excessive tugging on the neck and there's just traction, forget about the rotational component of subluxating C1 and C2, traction alone starts to affect C3, 4, and 5, which keeps the diaphragm alive, right? C3, 4, and 5 keep the diaphragm alive due to the phrenic nerve. So now there could be breathing problems, there could be cardiovascular issues. If you look back at the medulla oblongata, that's the cardiovascular control center. That's the center that controls the breathing as well. So major issue, they've done autopsies on babies with SIDS, sudden infant death syndrome, SIDS, or crib death. These are babies that typically lie on their stomach with their head turned, which creates more rotation of the atlas. And if there's already excessive rotation there that was compressing that vagal nerve, now it's going to compromise heart function even more and breathing and it halts. And that's when these babies die of crib death or sudden infant death syndrome. Uh, there was a prominent uh, uh, physician, I think his name was Gottfried Gutman, who autopsied about a thousand babies and found uh, 1,500 babies and all 1,500 of them had what he referred to as atlantoaxial instability or what we call subluxation between C1 and C2, okay? And that creates a lot of neurological compromise and can affect the health and well-being and development of the baby. Coming through the birth canal is really important. Vaginal deliveries are really important because if you look at these fontanelles, if you look at the sutures, and you look at the, let me go back here, the diameter of the baby's head and the diameter of the vaginal canal, the math just does not add up. So thank goodness these fontanelles and these sutures, they overlap and they fold upon each other. So as the baby is crowning, these fontanelles overlap and fold. And as the baby comes out, once there's crowning, there's this like recoiling effect of those fontanelles and sutures. The bones recoil back to their space and to their natural place. But going from that compressed to that opened up, it creates a pump of CSF. So compressing it to come through the vaginal canal, and once it comes out, it expands and it recoils, creating a pump. It's called a craniosacral pump, pumping cerebral spinal fluid from the brain down to the spinal cord. Extremely important to do that. Think of what happens if you cut a cocoon and there's a butterfly that, you know, a caterpillar that made the metamorphosis into the butterfly and the butterfly is supposed to break through itself. It's supposed to come through that tight slit so that it compresses the wings. And as it breaks through all on its own, the wings go from a compressed to a recoiled sprung out position and allows it to fly. But if you cut the cocoon for the butterfly, it just comes out and it drops to the ground. It never flies on its own. So we see similar situations with humans where when you cut the cocoon or you, you go for a C-section, these are babies that have higher incidence of pulmonary and lung issues and asthma and bronchitis, and then also tend to have some neurological deficits, whether they be learning disabilities or whether they be depression or bipolar as they grow up. There's some uh, higher incidence of findings clinically with that. Okay, so keep that in mind. And also vaginal deliveries are important, not just for breathing, not just for the CSF pump and for the lungs to get, you know, now, now when you come out, the lungs are being compressed as well. So the lungs are compressed and the baby comes out, <gasps> takes that first gasp of full tidal volume air. Okay, very important. That's why there's a lot of respiratory issues that tend to show with C-section babies. And then you have the bacteria. 
So the building up of the immune system going through the vaginal canal is extremely important. When you bypass that, the sterile environment of the, of the baby's intestines becomes a little bit compromised and the immune system becomes compromised. So natu natural vaginal deliveries are great for building up the bacteria in the intestines, taking in that from the, from the mouth, respiration, compressing the lungs for great volume, and then CSF pumping, all very important. Uh, this is just a, another view, looks like a bird's eye view, looking downward, and what this is showing, just wanted to show you some of the ligaments here, the round ligament, an ovarian ligament, uh, here's the uterus. This is when women, especially in the first trimester, in the first 12 weeks, feel a lot of pulling and discomfort in the lower abdomen, you know, the, the the hormones are having a major effect on lengthening and stretching of those ligaments, preparing the uterus uh, for growth. Okay. So there's the round ligament, the ovarian ligament, and the broad ligament. Here's the rectus abdominis muscle, just orienting yourself. Okay. Okay, uh, ovarian follicles contain oocytes in various stages of development, uh, follicular cells and granulosa cells. We'll show you what they are. The mature cell is often referred to as the graphian follicle, uh, is ready to rupture and expel the secondary oocyte. After that, you're left with the corpus luteum. Uh, after ovulation, when the empty follicle produces progesterone, estrogen, inhibin, and relaxin. So what we're seeing in this picture this illustration here is on the right hand side this is what's happening here in the ovary okay and it's moving in this direction it's going clockwise everything's going in this direction so we start with this primordial follicle then we have our primary follicle then we have a secondary follicle what I want you to see is this purple cavity here is called an antrum and it's filled with follicular fluid. It's filled with follicular fluid. You can see here, even the mature follicle has more follicular fluid. That follicular fluid is made by these follicle out here, all of these cells, these follicles out here. Now, when the pressure builds up and builds up and builds up in that antrum, what ends up happening is it ruptures. It's like a balloon that has too much air and it pops. And what it pushes out is the secondary oocyte, right? The discharge of the secondary oocyte, this is ovulation. This happens due to the follicular, due to FSH, right? That spiked very much. And FSH, follicle, uh, follicle stimulating hormone. Let me go back a second. Let me clear that out. Okay, let's go back here. So FSH is what created, so let's say high FSH created all this follicular fluid. What created ovulation was now primarily an increase in LH, luteinizing hormone. That's luteinizing hormone that created the discharge, the ovulation. And then what we're left with is this corpus luteum that's going to push out progesterone and estrogen primarily. And the, so this is actually now an endocrine organ. That corpus luteum is creating hormones that are going to prepare the uterus for implantation. Okay, and then it's going to degenerate and you're left with a corpus albicans. Okay, that's it in a nutshell. Okay, so the formation of gametes in the ovaries is oogenesis, like there was spermatogenesis. It begins in the female. It begins before a female is born with the process of meiosis, not mitosis, meiosis. Uh, when the primordial germ cells migrate from the yolk sac to the ovaries during fetal development, they differentiate into oogonia. Oogonia divide into germ cells, some of which become primary oocyte. So let's look at this video.
Oogenesis is the production of female gametes, or secondary oocytes. The process of oogenesis takes place in the two ovaries. In females, oogenesis begins with the development of oogonia prior to birth. During fetal development, the diploid oogonia undergo mitotic cell division to produce many more oogonia. Most of the oogonia degenerate before puberty. An oogonium and the single layer of cuboidal follicular cells surrounding it form a primordial follicle. The diploid oogonia stem cells develop into larger primary oocytes that enter prophase of the first meiotic division during fetal development. However, a diploid oogonia does not complete prophase until after puberty. After puberty, during the beginning of each monthly ovarian cycle, a primary oocyte is stimulated to finish the first meiotic division. During the first meiotic division, the follicular cells surrounding the primary oocyte increase in number. In a graphene follicle just before ovulation, the primary oocyte completes the first meiotic division, forming a secondary oocyte and a smaller first polar body. The secondary oocyte and first polar body each have 23 chromosomes. However, since each chromosome still has two chromatids, two copies of DNA, then each cell contains 46 DNA molecules. The first polar body may complete meiosis II, thereby producing two polar bodies, which degenerate. The secondary oocyte begins the second meiotic division. However, it pauses in metaphase II. After ovulation, the secondary oocyte is carried down the uterine tube toward the uterus. If a sperm cell penetrates the secondary oocyte, Meiosis II resumes. Penetration of the secondary oocyte by sperm triggers the completion of the second meiotic division. During this division, cytokinesis produces a haploid ovum, or mature egg, containing the majority of cytoplasm, and a haploid second polar body. The polar body degenerates. When the nucleus of the ovum fuses with the nucleus of the sperm, a diploid nucleus is formed, and the cell is then known as a zygote. The zygote is the first embryonic stage. The zygote contains 46 DNA molecules, 23 from the sperm and 23 from the ovum. Here's the summary. Okay, that was a great video. Let's clear that out. Okay, so let's just take a look at some of the features here. Let's see if there's anything I really want to point out. Okay, so each month after puberty, follicular stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone are going to stimulate the development of the primordial follicles. Uh, a few start to grow, developing into the primary follicle. And usually only one is going to reach maturity. This just shows the different layers. This is a late primary follicle 
we can see it has different, let me see if I can bring out the pen here. Here's your primary oocyte. These are granulosa cells. Here's the zona pellucida, collagen fibers. Remember that protein collagen? What you end up needing for collagen is vitamin C. Vitamin C. Okay. Um, in later stages of development, the primary oocyte is surrounded by several layers of granulosa cells. The glycoprotein, zona pellucida, forms between the primary oocyte and the granulosa cells. The maturation continues, the primary follicle develops into a secondary follicle, and the theca folliculi forms into the stromal cells. Okay, so you can see here, here's the theca follicula, and again, there's an externa and an interna. Here's the zona pellucida. Here's the primary oocyte. You're going to hear this term, corona radiata. These are the granulosa cells. This is now your secondary follicle. You have your blood vessels. You have your collagen fibers. We have these stromal cells. In a secondary follicle, the theca differentiates into the theca interna and the theca externa, that's what I showed you before. The innermost, innermost layer of the granulosa cells becomes the corona radiata, and the secondary follicle becomes the mature graphene follicle. So here's the mature graphene follicle now. Here's the mature. And again, you can see that now those granulosa cells are producing more fluid Right, you can see the antrum is filled with follicular fluid here. Here again is the zona pellucida. Here's the corona radiata. Right, it's starting to create this aura. Right, it's going to end up creating this aura, this radiating aura. These are the granulosa cells. And again, you can see the theca folliculi with the external and internal layer to it. While in the mature follicle, the diploid primary oocyte completes meiosis I, uh, producing a haploid secondary oocyte with the majority of the cytoplasm and a haploid first polar body, right? In that video, it shows how it kind of, I believe, disintegrates, right? Uh, at ovulation, both cells and the corona radiata enter the uterine tube. If sperm are present, then fertilization is going to take place the secondary oocyte continues into meiosis II. Um, an ovum and a second uh, polar body form. The ovum becomes the zygote when it unites with the sperm. Let's look at the fertilization process. Fertilization is the process by which the two gametes from the parents fuse their genetic material to form a new individual. Fertilization requires that sperm cells swimming through the uterine tube contact a secondary oocyte. Once the sperm make contact with the oocyte and penetrate through the cells of the corona radiata, they enter the area of the zona pellucida. A glycoprotein in the zona pellucida triggers release of digestive enzymes from the head of the sperm. So over here is the head of the sperm. That's the acrosome. And there's going to be this reaction between the zona pellucidum and the head of the sperm. And it's going to release these enzymes that are going to allow it to break right through that. These enzymes help to digest a path for the sperm to reach the plasma membrane of the secondary oocyte. Syngamy occurs when the first sperm to reach the plasma membrane fuses with the secondary oocyte. 
Thingamy triggers changes in the membrane of the secondary oocyte that block additional sperm cells, or polyspermy, from occurring. After a sperm penetrates the cell, the secondary oocyte completes meiosis II. The oocyte subsequently divides into a larger ovum and a smaller secondary polar body that fragments and degenerates. All right, let's close that out. Let's get back into the PowerPoint. So we showed you where fertilization takes place. It should take place um, inside the fallopian tube. On the left-hand side, you have a normal pregnancy where you have the ovary that's pushed out or ovulated the egg. The egg is now moving through the fallopian tube or uterine tube. Now sperm came in this way and fertilized it, let's say. Now, if that happens, now you have the egg that's implanting into the uterus. That should happen. An ectopic pregnancy is when you have the egg on the right-hand side that implants itself somewhere in the uh, uterine tube, in the fallopian tube. Okay. Okay, so this is just showing where you've got your different phases. This is what was shown in the video before. So you have mitosis during the early fetal life that gives rise to the primary oocyte. And then during fetal development, meiosis one begins. After puberty, the primary oocyte complete meiosis one, which produces a secondary oocyte and a first polar body that may or may not divide again. The secondary oocyte begins at mitosis two. So now from here to here is mitosis two. The secondary oocyte and the first polar body is ovulated. After fertilization, meiosis II resumes and the oocyte splits into an ovum and a secondary polar body. The nuclei of the sperm cell and the ovum unite, forming a diploid zygote. And again, here's just another picture, another illustration that kind of shows, well, here's the primordial follicle, primary follicle, secondary follicle, the graphene follicle, and then ovulation, the secondary oocyte. And you could see where these things come from, right? You could see the split off. You could see from here, from here, and from here. Okay, from oogenesis. Females have two uterine tubes that extend from the uterus to the ovary. The tubes are the pathway for the sperm to reach the ovum and for the secondary oocytes and the fertilized ova to travel to the uterus. The end of the tube is the infundibulum, the fimbriae, those were the fingers that project from it, and the ampulla, that's the widest part of the tube. Okay, this is again that picture. Again, we know where the fallopian tube is. There's the ampulla. They say it's the widest part. There's the stalk, the infundibulum. Here's the endometrium, myometrium, and perimetrium. The rugae is the roughened portion of the vaginal canal. Here is the cervix. And then the invagination next to it is the fornix. Now, the fornix acts as a reservoir for sperm. So sperm can actually hang out in this invaginated portion for up to five days and live. And typically the female sperm live longer than male sperm. So this is why it becomes a little bit tricky where let's say you know that there's a 28-day uh, cycle. And at the halfway mark, which means at day 14, is where ovulation should take place, right around the mid-cycle. So at around day 14, we're going to have luteinizing hormone spike. And now it's going to take about 24 hours or so for that egg to kind of move in this direction, right? So there's a very, very short window. Some say 24 hours, some say 48 hours. So one to two days at best for fertilization to take place. 
Now let's say woman's watching her cycle and she says, okay, today is day 14. So day 10, she decides to have unprotected sex. And now unprotected sex, there's ejaculate, there's sperm that are hanging out in here. Now let's say this is a couple that's not trying to plan a pregnancy. They're using a method knowing the menstrual cycle knowing when ovulation takes place at day 14. So in their minds, they're thinking that pregnancy, that fertilization and implantation are only gonna happen from let's say day 14 to let's say day 16, around there. And they had unprotected sex at day 10. So they think it's safe. Now, it takes one of these sperm to live. They can live up to five days. So now it's day 15. And remember, when did she ovulate? Day 14. So they didn't have sex at all day 14, 15, or 16, but had sex at day 10. And that sperm can live up to five days. Now you're going to have one of those female sperm that live longer that come in and do their thing. And that's how a lot of unwanted uh, pregnancies take place, or unplanned pregnancies, I should say, take place. Okay, so beware of that. Um, I kind of use that method um, for the children. I have three. Um, my first, we wanted a boy, so we just made sure we did it at day, you know, the halfway point. And not that it's a guarantee, but it increases the chances. Um, and then we wanted a girl, so we did it before ovulation, hoping that those female sperm would live longer, and then we had the girl. And then the third one, you know, didn't matter. Boy, girl, it's just whatever it's meant to be, it's meant to be, and that was my third boy. So we got boy, girl, boy. Uh, the uterine tubes has three layers, the mucosa, muscularis, and serosa. Uh, the simple ciliated columnar epithelium of the mucosa contains cilia, and those are going to beat rhythmically to move the fertilized ovum or the secondary oocyte to the uterus. Um, peg cells that are in the tube secrete a fluid that help to provide nourishment for the ovum. So you can see here, let me see if I can get my pen again. So here's the lumen of the uterine tube. These are ciliated simple columnar, and these are peg cells. These are non-ciliated with microvilli. These are the cilia, and these are gonna beat rhythmically. And then these other ones, these are peg cells. They're non-ciliated with microvilli. So what are those peg cells going to do? Those peg cells are gonna secrete a fluid that provides nourishment for the ovum okay think of it as um, you know similar to in the male how there's the bulbo urethral gland and there's the seminal vesicle and the prostate uh, the uterus is part of the pathway for sperm deposited in the, the vagina to reach the uterine tube the top of it was called the fundus the central part is the body the inferior part we showed you was the cervix, and the isthmus is between the body um, and the cervix. Uh, the uterus is where the fertilized egg should be implanted. Otherwise, anywhere outside of it was called an ectopic pregnancy. Uh, the interior of the body is the uterine cavity. The interior of the cervix is the cervical canal. And then there's two openings, the opening of the canal in the uterus is the internal os, and then the opening of the canal into the vaginal area is the external os. It just means internal mouth and external mouth, basically. Uh, the perimetrium, remember earlier I said it's three layers, the endometrium, myometrium, and perimetrium. So the endometrium is the innermost layer, and those have a few, uh, two important layers, the stratum functionalis. That's the layer that sheds uh, each month. Uh, and then there's the stratum uh, basalis, and that's going to give rise to a new uh, stratum functionalis after each menstruation. There's the middle layer, 
That's the myometrium, that's smooth muscle. And then there's the outermost, which is the serosa or the perimetrium. And again, this is just a nice illustration showing uh, the endometrium on the left-hand side. Let me bring my cursor here. We can see the endometrium with its two layers, the stratum functionalis and the stratum by, uh, basalis, and here's the myometrium. Okay. Here you can see this is just different magnifications. So now we're looking at on the right hand side a larger magnification of the uh, endometrium. So you can see here is the lumen on top. These are ciliated, simple columnar. And then you got your functionalis, stratum functionalis, and then deeper towards the base, the basalis, stratum basalis. Okay, so the branches of the internal iliac artery is called, the, uh, called uterine arterioles. That's going to supply the uterus. There are uterine arteries that give rise to arcuate arteries. The arcuate is going to feed the myometrium. And then these branch into radial arteries that go deep into the myometrium. And then there are straight arteries that supply the stratum basalis. And those straight arteries have the ability of vasoconstricting. And when they do, lack of blood to the endometrium and it sloughs off. When they vasodilate, it builds it up. So here's a great picture. And you can see here... Here's the uterine artery. Here's the arcuate artery. Here's the uterine. And then you have the straight arterioles, right? You can see how they're feeding the endometrium, right? Here's the stratum functionalis and the stratum basalis. That's a really important um, concept. And then there's the spiral arterioles as well. Look, it's named if you just by its structure. It looks like it makes a spiral. Uh, secretory cells of the cervix produce cervical mucus, which is chemically more hospitable to sperm during ovulation uh, because it is less viscous and more alkaline. It's involved in helping to nourish the sperm as well. Okay, the mucosa of the vagina is continuous with that of the uterus. And you can see it's, again, it's, we're talking about epithelium. Up on top on the left, you can see the lumen of the vagina. Then there's the non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium, right? You can see it magnified on the right-hand side, non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. Those are flat, irregular cells. The epithelium and areola connected tissue of the vagina lie in a series of transverse folds called rugae. And the muscularis is composed of an outer circular layer and an inner longitudinal layer of smooth muscle. And that's going to allow the vagina to stretch during intercourse and childbirth. And the hymen is a thin fold of vascularized mucous membrane that, that partially closes the inferior end of the vagina. The vulva or pudendum refers to the external genitalia of the female, and it's going to include the mons pubis, labia minora, labia majora, clitoris, and the vestibule. The vestibule has the hymen, the vaginal orifice, external urethral orifice, and the opening of ducts and several glands. So here is the those structures. Here's the mons pubis. Here is the prepis of the clitoris, would be analogous to the, the foreskin of the male. Here is the clitoris that would be analogous to the glans penis. Then you have the labia majora and minora, the hymen. Here's the vaginal orifice dilated, and then the anus. Again, explains why it's very important for women when they go to the bathroom and they have bowel movements the direction of wiping is very, very important. If a woman wipes from posterior to anterior, the chances of spreading bacteria from here to here are very, very high. 
so appropriate. Wiping for women should always be anterior to posterior. Okay. Okay, so, uh, there are paraurethral glands known as the Skene's gland. There's the greater vestibular gland known as uh, Bartholin's gland. And then there's the bulb, of the, the bulb of the vestibule. So the Skene's gland secretes mucus and they're embedded in the wall of the urethra. And that would be kind of homologous to the prostate gland. The Bartholin's gland produced mucus during sexual arousal to provide lubrication. And that would be homologous to the Cowper's gland or bulbourethral gland. And then the bulb of the vestibule has two masses of erectile tissue that engorges during sexual arousal to narrow the vaginal orifice to apply pressure to the penis during intercourse for more stimulation. And that would be homologous to the erectile tissue of the penis. Again, here is some of the important um, reproductive structures. Let's see if we can highlight a few again. Here's the pubic symphysis. Now here's the bulbs of the vestibule, right? Here's one right here. And there's another one on the other side, but it's just covered by the muscle. We have the Bartholin's gland that's here. We can see it right there, again, covered by muscle. Okay, uh, let's see what else we have here. Here is the Clitoris, right here. Here's the ischial tuberosity, that's bone of the pelvis. Here's the urogenital triangle. This is just the space that's made here. You can see this triangle by those muscles. And then there's the anal triangle, again, made by the muscles in here. Okay, and you don't have to know the names of, of the muscles. So if we do a comparison of homologous structures, male to female, we have the ovaries and the males, the testes, and the females, the ovum, and the male, the sperm. There's the labia majora in females, the scrotum in males, labia minora in females, spongy urethra in males. There's the vestibule in females, the intermediate urethra in males, clitoris, glands, penis, periurethral glands, prostate, greater vestibular glands, bulbo, urethral gland, or Cowper's gland. The mammary glands are located in each of the two breasts or modified uh, sudiferous glands that produce milk. Both males and females have mammary glands. It's just that testosterone inactivates them in, in males and estrogen activates them in females. Uh, mammary glands contain 15 to 30 lobes. Each lobe has lobules containing milk secreting glands called alveoli. And each breast has a nipple containing lactiferous ducts where the milk emerges. And the skin around the nipple is called the areola. Okay, so these are the structures that we just listed before. Here's the nipple with the skin around it, the areolar. Here's the lactiferous duct. Here's the mammary duct. Here are the lobules that contain the alveoli. And then the muscle above it is the pectoris uh, major. We have ribs deep to it. There's fascia, pectoral fascia. And then between the ribs, of course, are intercostal muscles. Again, on the right-hand side, all the way on the right, you can see the nipple with the areolar. Breast cancer, one of the most common malignancies affecting women. It's estimated that one out of eight women will be affected by the disease in their lifetime, and the risk of breast cancer increase with age. It peaks between the ages of 45, 45 and 64. Breast cancer is the leading cause of death in women between the ages of 30 and 50. And essentially, breast cancer is defined as accelerated growth of abnormal cells that make up the mammary glands and the ducts. It typically shows up as a hard tumor or a lump, or it's irregularly shaped. It's fixed in position, it's non-mobile, and typically painless. Um, oftentimes, dimpling of the breast or retraction of the nipple is a sign, or the skin looks like the appearance of an orange peel. This is uh, just one case of advanced, uh, sadly, uh, breast cancer. 
really no reason for this to take place within the United States at this point with all of the uh, wellness care visits that take place. Uh, the examination, palpate the tumor. Palpate means to examine by sense or touch. Now there's mammographies, the sonograms, uh, ultrasounds, thermographies. There's so many different tests that could be done. Um, a punch biopsy is when they actually insert a needle into the tissue and pull out a core sample of the tumor. There are genetic factors, which is one of the, the primary causes. Um, the Burka gene, uh, they've been linked to breast cancer. And it's a mutation in a particular gene is the Burka 1 has been shown to cause a deadly type of breast cancer. Um, mutations in the gene BRCA1 inactivates a tumor suppressor gene known as P10, which inhibits the uh, uncontrolled cell growth that's seen in breast cancer. Smoking, alcohol, excessive caffeine, fried food, stress, um, no breastfeeding, toxins, pesticides, um, high fat diets, low fiber diets, diets low in A, B, C, and E, um, have all been known to be uh, associated uh, with breast cancer. I think causes are really hard to determine, but at least we know that there is strong affiliation or association. When we look at uh, pap smears, you can see um, how you have normal and then abnormal. So um, these are just larger, variably shaped nuclei on the top. And then in the second column here, we could see many dividing cells. They're disorganized in their arrangement. And then the third one down, variation in size and shape. And then all the way on the bottom, loss of normal features. So this is what pathologists or histologists are trained uh, to look at. It's not our job to do this, but just giving you an idea when a pap smear is done, and they say cervical dysplasia or cervical cancer. This is what they're looking at. Usually cervical cancer is secondary to an STD, which is HPV, human papillomavirus. Uh, Non-pregnant females experience cyclical changes in the ovaries and uterus lasting approximately a month. And the cycle involves oogenesis and preparation by the uterus to receive a fertilized egg. The ovarian cycle includes changes that occur during and after maturation of the oocyte. The uterine cycle involves a change in the endometrium that prepared for implantation of the developing embryo. So we're going to take a look at the female reproductive cycle. I think we have a video that's going to show the connections here, uh, but you can see all the way on top how you have the hypothalamus releasing gonadotropin, releasing hormone. Again, going to the anterior pituitary, releasing FSH and LH. FSH, follicular stimulating hormone, is going to stimulate, we could see right here, and it's going to stimulate here. So it's going to be initial growth of the ovarian follicle. It's involved in further development of the ovarian follicles and their secretion of estrogen and inhibit. Whereas the luteinizing hormone, that's involved with the ovulation, and it's involved with the corpus luteum, which corpus luteum is an endocrine organ that secretes progesterone, estrogen, relaxin, and inhibin by the corpus luteum. And then we see the effects of estrogen and inhibin and relaxin and progesterone. So progesterone is going to stimulate the endometrial glands to secrete glycogen and lipids, which serve as the initial nutrient source for the fertilized egg if implantation occurs. Uh, high levels inhibit the release of gonadotropin-releasing hormone, FSH, and LH. Relaxin inhibits contractions of the uterine smooth muscle. Relax, right? During labor, it increases the flexibility of the pubic symphysis and dilates the uterine cervix again. Relax. Inhibin inhibits the release of FSH. And then we have estrogens that promote the development and maintenance of the female reproductive structures as well as the secondary sex characteristics. It's involved in protein anabolism or protein synthesis. It lowers blood cholesterol. It stimulates the proliferation of the stratum basalis to form a new stratum functionalis after menstru menstruation occurs. And moderate levels inhibit the release of gonadotropic releasing hormone, follicular stimulating hormone, and LH. The phase, the phase of the female reproductive cycle 
can range from 24 to 36 days. They divide into four phases, menstrual, preovulatory, ovulation, and post-ovulatory. <clears throat> and rather than have me go through this with you, I'd rather prefer show the video that walks through these cycles. I will also go over the different um, hormones that are involved in these different phases, but you can see here's the menstrual phase from about days one through five, and then there's the pre-ovulatory phase, and then there's ovulation and post-ovulatory phase. And you can see the days are here, and what takes place in those phases, menstruation, proliferation of the endometrium, the secretory phase, and then again, menstruation over here. All right, we could see some of the primary hormones like estrogen working here and progesterone and estrogen working here. And you could see what cells produce them. So the secondary follicle, the graphene follicle, and the um, ovulated egg are involved in producing estrogen, whereas the corpus luteum is going to be involved in producing progesterone and estrogen together are really going to be designed to prepare the uterus for implantation. Um, also, the video should be going over how these hormones kind of move in synergy and how they spike at certain levels and why um, they spike at different days. Okay, so you can see here right towards the middle, you see that LH spikes somewhere between day 12, 13, and 14. Assuming it's a 28-day cycle, this, this right here, that phase, that's where ovulation takes place, and that's where um, fertilization takes place. That's where pregnancy takes place. Okay. So the feedback is important in regulating hormonally controlled cycles. High levels of estrogen during the last part of the preovulatory phase have a positive feedback effect on cells secreting luteinizing hormone and gonadotropic releasing hormone that bring about ovulation. And there are many hormonal interactions between the uh, ovarian and uterine cycle. Okay, this one just shows how you have high levels of estrogen from the almost mature follicle stimulating uh, release of more gonadotropic releasing hormone and LH. We could see that take place. Then you could see gonadotropic releasing hormone promoting the release of FSH and LH. And then at number three, you could see the LH surge brings about ovulation. Okay, I'm going to show a video that should go over this cycle. Let's see if we can find it. Here we go. There is a complex interaction between the anterior pituitary gland, the hypothalamus, the ovaries, and the uterus that leads to the monthly changes that women experience during their monthly reproductive cycle. The two cycles that constitute these monthly changes are the ovarian cycle and the uterine or menstrual cycle. Hormonal messengers orchestrate both female cycles. Hormones secreted by the hypothalamus start the process. Gonadotropin releasing hormone is released from the hypothalamus. Look at the days on the bottom Gonadotropin left. Gonadotropin releasing hormone level slowly rises as the monthly cycle begins. It binds to receptors in the anterior pituitary and stimulates the release of the gonadotropins, follicle stimulating hormone called FSH and luteinizing hormone or LH. The anterior pituitary gonadotropin FSH travels through the bloodstream to the ovaries and promotes follicular growth. Increased follicular growth promotes estrogen production. The release of FSH and LH from the anterior pituitary is inhibited as the level of estrogen in the blood begins to rise. At the same time, 
these gonadotropins continue to be produced and to accumulate in the anterior pituitary. Eventually, the concentration of estrogen is high, which triggers the release of the buildup gonadotropins. The result is an intense flow of luteinizing hormone and to a lesser degree, follicle stimulating hormone. The luteinizing hormone surge initiates ovulation, the release of the secondary oocyte, and triggers a decline in estrogen production by the follicle. Luteinizing hormone is responsible for transforming the ruptured follicle into a corpus luteum. The corpus luteum secretes both estrogen and progesterone, increasing their blood levels. These increased ovarian hormones inhibit the release of luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone. The corpus luteum also releases the hormone inhibin, which enhances this inhibitory effect. As gonadotropin levels decline, the corpus luteum begins to degenerate reducing estrogen and progesterone production. This sharp reduction in ovarian hormones triggers the release of gonadotropin-releasing hormone, luteinizing hormone, and follicle-stimulating hormone, and the cycle begins again. The ovarian cycle is the monthly sequence of events that takes place in the ovaries. The three phases of the ovarian cycle are the pre-ovulatory phase, the ovulatory phase, and the post-ovulatory phase. Prior to ovulation, primary follicles develop into secondary follicles. The number of follicular cells surrounding the primary oocyte increases. Estrogen secretions increase as well. During the pre-ovulatory phase, one of the secondary follicles develops into a single, dominant, mature, or graphene follicle. The mature follicle continues to secrete estrogen, and estrogen blood levels peak. Luteinizing and follicle-stimulating hormones reach their peak. The primary oocyte has progressed through meiosis I and has begun meiosis II, stopping at metaphase II. It is now known as a secondary oocyte. The luteinizing hormone surge signals the mature follicle to rupture and release the secondary oocyte into the pelvic cavity. Secretion of estrogen decreases, thereby inhibiting the release of luteinizing hormone, stopping the ovulation of another secondary oocyte. After ovulation and the release of the secondary oocyte, the ruptured follicle collapses and becomes a corpus luteum. Stimulated by luteinizing hormone, the corpus luteum secretes progesterone and estrogen. This prepares the endometrium of the uterus for implantation. If the secondary oocyte is fertilized, the resulting embryo will implant into the prepared endometrium. If the secondary oocyte is not fertilized, it degenerates. The corpus luteum disintegrates, levels of ovarian hormones decrease, and the cycle starts again with gonadotropin-releasing hormone and follicle-stimulating hormone, triggering the maturation of follicles in the ovaries. The uterus goes through a cyclical developmental pattern to be ready for implantation and support of an embryo. The uterine or menstrual cycle is under the control of ovarian hormones. The uterine cycle also has three phases, the menstrual phase, the proliferative phase, and the secretory phase. By convention, the beginning of the menstrual cycle is considered to be the first day of the menstrual flow. Changes in the endometrium are triggered by changes in levels of ovarian hormones. 
Falling levels of progesterone cause the spiral arterioles within the uterine endometrial lining to constrict. As a result, the cells of the stratum functionalis die and slough off. After menses, the proliferative phase of the uterine cycle begins. In response to estrogens secreted by the maturing ovarian follicles, the cells of the stratum basalis proliferate, regenerating the stratum functionalis and repairing the endometrium. After mm -hmm. ovulation, progesterone and estrogens secreted by the corpus luteum in the ovary, stimulate further development of the stratum functionalis. The endometrial glands grow and coil. The endometrium becomes even more vascular and continues to thicken slightly. And the endometrial glands begin to secrete glycogen. If fertilized, implantation of an embryo occurs and is nutritionally maintained by the endometrium. If fertilization does not occur, then the corpus luteum disintegrates, levels of progesterone and estrogen drop, and in response, the stratum functionalis of the uterine wall sloughs off during menstruation. <clears throat> the 28 days of the female reproductive cycle can be divided into four phases. Days one through five of the monthly cycle are the menstrual phase. Low levels of progesterone and estrogen allow for the shedding of the stratum functionalis of the endometrium. These low levels allow the hypothalamus to release gonadotropin-releasing hormone, which in turn stimulates the release of follicle-stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone from the anterior pituitary. Increasing levels of follicle-stimulating hormone stimulate follicular development. Days 5 through 13 of the cycle consist of the pre-ovulatory ovarian and proliferative uterine phases. The presence of follicle-stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone stimulates the development of ovarian follicles, which then increase their production of estrogen. The increased levels of estrogen stimulate the stratum basalis of the uterine endometrium to proliferate and thicken. As the ovarian follicles mature, and make more estrogen, the high levels of estrogen create a positive feedback loop to the hypothalamus and anterior pituitary. This stimulates secretion of gonadotropin-releasing hormone, follicle-stimulating hormone, and luteinizing hormone, and further maturation of the follicles. On day 14, ovulation occurs as a result of a surge of luteinizing hormone signaling the mature ovarian follicle to rupture and release a secondary oocyte. During days 15 through 28, the post-ovulatory and secretory phases of the ovarian and uterine cycles, the ruptured follicle collapses and reforms to become the corpus luteum. The corpus luteum secretes estrogen and larger amounts of progesterone, causing the endometrium of the uterus to further thicken. Glycogen is secreted from the endometrial glands to prepare for a possible embryo. Fuel. Increased secretion of inhibin hormone signals the anterior pituitary to decrease secretion of FSH and LH. If the secondary oocyte is not fertilized, the corpus luteum disintegrates, and the cycle begins again. 
What a great video that was. Great to watch that a second time from a functional standpoint. Really, really good. Okay. Uh, Birth control, we're going to get into birth control, not not too much. I mean, I, I guess in some degree, it, it may be good to know. I know there are a lot of, you know, drug-induced nutrient depletions associated with some of these. Um, birth control methods are designed to limit the number of children produced by preventing conception. Um, complete abstinence, that's the only 100% reliable method. Otherwise, there's sur surgical sterilization, there's hormonal methods, and periodic uh, abstinence. Here's a list of all the different um, methods, whether they're uh, complete abstinence on top, um, the surgical sterilization, whether it's vasectomy or tubal ligation, when they uh, tie the tubes. Um, there is hormonal methods like the oral contraceptive and non-oral contraceptive, which is mostly the skin patches. There are intra um, intrauterine devices, there are spermicides, there are barrier methods, uh, typically uh, the diaphragm is probably the most uh, popular, the male condom or the female version of that. Um, and then periodic abstinence, there's the uh, rhythm method or temperature, symptothermal methods. The surgical sterilization, that's an intervention to render an individual incapable of reproduction. There's the vasectomy or tubal ligation. The vasectomy is done in males by removing or cutting a portion of the vas deferens. And the tubal ligation in females ties or closes the uh, fallopian tubes. And then there's the non-incisional sterilization employs the insertion of a coil made of plastic and metal into each uterine tube then scar tissue grows and it blocks uh, the tubes. Uh, hormonal methods include the oral contraceptive that are designed to prevent pregnancy by inhib inhibiting uh, ovulation. And there are several types of oral hormonal methods of contraception. Uh, there is combined oral contraceptive that contain both progestin and estrogen. And then there's the extended cycle birth control pills contain progestin and estrogen, and menstruation occurs every 13 weeks. Uh, there's the mini pill, contains progestin only, and progestin thickens the cervical mucus. The non-oral method is the contraceptive skin patch, the vaginal contraceptive ring, and then there's the emergency contraception, which is the oral method. Two pills are taken, uh, one within 72 hours of unprotected intercourse, and the other is taken 12 hours after uh, the first. Barrier methods employ a physical barrier to block sperm from gaining access to the uterine cavity. Uh, that's the male condom or the female condom, which is the vaginal pouch, diaphragm, or a cervical cap. Uh, periods of abstinence is employed when the couple has knowledge of the physiological change that takes place during the female cycle. The first method used was the rhythm method a couple abstains from intercourse when ovulation is likely to occur. And then the symptothermal method can be used to avoid or achieve pregnancy. Um, it uses normally fluctuating physiological markers, such as temperature and changes in the cervical mucus color and texture. Uh, let's see what else we have here that I'd like to cover. Aging. Uh, the first decade reproductive system in the juvenile state, approximately at age 10, all hormone-directed changes lead to puberty. Um, puberty, the male begins to produce sperm. Females enter menarche, which is the beginning of uh, menstruation. Still, on age in the reproductive system with age, fertility starts to decline. In women, it's between the ages of 30 and 40. Uh, ovarian follicles become exhausted and estrogen levels uh, start to decline. In men, uh, reproduction is still possible into the 80s or 90s. At around age 55 or so, testosterone levels start to decline, sperm levels drop, and the sexual desire starts to wane. Uh, most males over 60 experience BPH, benign prostatic hypertrophy, where the prostate enlarges to two to four times uh, its normal size. 
And then there are things uh, nutritionally and nutraceutical-wise to help manage that as well. Great slide here showing uh, homeostasis, showing how all the body systems connect, uh, whether it's the integumentary system, where the androgens promote the growth of body hair. Um, estrogen stimulates the deposition of fat in the breast, the abdomen, and hips. If we look at the skeleton, androgens and estrogens stimulate the growth and maintenance of bones of the skeletal system. Um, androgens stimulate the growth of skeletal muscle. Androgens influence libido or sex drive when you talk about neural function. Estrogen plays a major role in development of certain regions of the uh, brain in males. The endocrine system on the bottom left, testosterone and estrogen exert feedback effects uh, on the hypothalamus and the anterior pituitary. Cardiovascular system on the top right, estrogen lowers blood cholesterol levels and may reduce the risk of coronary arterial disease in women under age 50. Lymphatic system, the presence of antibiotic-like chemical in semen and the acidic pH of the vaginal fluid provide innate immunity against microbes in the reproductive tract. And the respiratory system, sexual arousal increases the rate and depth of breathing. Digestive tract, the presence of the fetus during pregnancy crowds the digestive organs, which leads to heartburn and constipation. And then the urinary system in males, the portion of the urethra that extends through the prostate and penis is a passageway for urine as well as semen, right? Female have different tracts. Males just have one. And then in men, uh, there's uh, testicular cancer, prostate disorders, erectile dysfunction issues in women, uh, PMS, premenstrual uh, syndrome, uh, premenstrual dysphoric disorder, endometriosis, there's breast cancer, ovarian cancer, yeast infections, um, PCOS, polyovarian cystic, uh, polycystic ovarian syndrome, I'm sorry, PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome, which is quite, um, quite common these days. Okay, so great things to, to discuss, and we'll probably hear some discussion on these topics. Okay, hope you found that uh, to be enlightening and interesting topic for you.